International Paper, the world's largest pulp and paper company, is taking a run at rival cardboard box maker Temple Inland with a $3.3 billion hostile offer. Temple Inland rejected the bid yesterday, International Paper's latest attempt to increase its share of the North American market, even though it's 46% higher than Temple Inland's closing price yesterday. Temple Inland is soaring in pre-market trading this morning, as you can see, up some 44%. The offer is now slightly above that $30.06 a share in cash that International Paper offered. Demand and prices for corrugated boxes have bounced back since collapsing during the financial crisis. International Paper says buying Temple Inland would increase its share of the North American box market to some 37% from about 27%. The company is being advised by UBS and says it has committed financing from the Swiss bank to back this offer. Now that hostile bid for Temple Inland underscores the recovery underway in mergers and acquisitions. Already the total value of global transactions this year has topped one trillion dollars and one of the key players in that market is right here on the inside track. Leon Calvaria is vice chairman at Citigroup Global Markets and head of its senior strategic advisory group uh, which includes most of Citi's top deal makers. Leon is the former head of Citi's consumer and healthcare M&A and a former executive with Triarch, billionaire Nelson Peltz's investment company. Leon, a delight to have you here this morning. Let's talk about Temple Inland and what it means. Hostel M&A, it's always exciting, but there hasn't been a whole lot of it. As of late, Hostel M&A has formed a smaller share of the global deal pie. How come? Thanks, Eric. Um, Hostel M&A is a tactic that people use in marketplaces when effectively they want to take their offer to shareholders when they find that they can't negotiate privately with companies. There's a long history going back over a number of years of developed techniques in the marketplace. And it's not surprising to see in a world where you have low interest rates, you have attractive assets, that people are taking their offers to shareholders. And as you've seen recently in the case of ConAgra and Royal Corp, as you've seen in the case of some of the exchanges and going back over time to Anheuser-Busch and Kraft, not an unusual tactic and interesting to watch to see how shareholders react. Oh, uh, no question interesting to see how shareholders react. Right now they're saying that international papers offer is good and somebody might actually come in there with something better even if it is an IP because the stock is trading above that cash offer price. But we put up that chart and I want to make specific reference to it because you see here 2007 hostile M&A totaled almost a trillion dollars in and of itself. That's almost as much M&A as we've had this year. Is there any likelihood that we're going to get back to those heady days uh, of 2007 when private equity firms were very active? And we're going to talk about uh, high yield financing, but also all this hostile activity. Eric, it's unlikely probably in the next year or two that you get back to this level of hostile activity. But I think what you'll see is hostile activity, the comeback that we're slowly seeing here illustrates that the M&A market, and we'll look at some slides in a few minutes, is slowly returning to health. Yeah, let's get, we're going to, I'm going to ask for one of those to be put up right now because people can see exactly what you're making reference to, this whole idea of the M&A cycle. Exactly. And you will see that we're a couple of years into that cycle, you know, having bottomed out probably early to mid 2009 and as we recover out of the cycle as interest rates remain low and as companies are comfortable acting strategically they will do more transactions. So here we have the red line being the current M&A cycle. I hate to talk about lines but it's necessary in this case right and the blue line which shows how heady things really did when it got rather when we got to the Hilton deal in July of 2007. Should anyone really expect that we're going to return to that time the credit will become so available and so cheap and available on such easy terms that everybody not just strategic buyers but financial sponsors the private equity firms will get as active as they were back then I think from the standpoint of the business world, I hope we don't return quite to those bubble eras because obviously there were some interesting consequences when we came out of that bubble <laughs> An period. Understatement. That said, if you look at that curve, there's plenty of room for increased activity going forward over the next few years without potentially getting into red zone territory. In other words, large transactions, significant amounts of leverage and potentially risky transactions being put out there. So I think we have room for increases of activity, room for significant increases of activity, but I don't see it returning to the 2007 period, certainly in this cycle.
Leon, talk to me about the confidence of CEOs. We always bring this up in the context of M&A because if a CEO isn't willing to do a deal, the deal isn't going to get done. We saw some awfully dismal signs of an economy weakening, particularly here in the United States sure. last week. We know Europe outside of Germany is weak. Just how confident can CEOs be going forward if the bottom, so to speak, is falling out from underneath them in terms of economic growth and the contribution it has to make to profits? Well, firstly, I don't think that CEOs view the bottom as falling out. We've obviously had some difficult data recently here, but as they look forward, CEOs look at low interest rates, they look at strategic imperatives, and are not necessarily going to get diverted from long-term objectives by two months of economic data. So I think that's one thing I would leave to the side. The second issue is the significant increase in transactions being done in emerging markets, where a lot of this data is not as relevant. Leon, we're talking about the role that emerging markets are playing in m and Obviously, InBev buying Anheuser-Busch plays a uh, is, is, is one to highlight. Let's take a look at the role that emerging market acquirers uh, have come to play in this market, a much bigger deal uh, these days than they used to be. China, Russia, Brazil, as we can see here by this chart, comparing, the deal, these are deals uh, for $500 million or more. It's almost, China is leading the pack. It's really striking, isn't it? Absolutely. A couple of important trends. Firstly, natural resource. Obviously, Chinese acquirers of natural resources have been an important priority for the country and for the various companies inside. And they are not necessarily, as you can tell, looking at the U.S. marketplace. And what we are seeing are flows between emerging markets, be it China into Africa, which is significant, China into Brazil, Brazil into other areas of emerging markets. So you have a category where effectively natural resources are scarce, and therefore there are acquisitions that are going to be looked at to bolster up various of the emerging markets that have huge demand. Second area is consumer products, where people are effectively looking at brands or technology that they can purchase. One that we worked on was the sale of Ford to Gili of China, which was a highly unusual transaction to have an iconic brand sold by an iconic company to an emerging markets champion that in the form of Nobody Zili. outside China had really heard of. No one had really heard of, but very sophisticated, very thoughtful, with a real vision for the business. That's a trend. Here's a question. We know they need resources. We know these emerging markets acquirers have a lot of money to spend. What about the expertise, the level of expertise? Clearly, they're prepared to hire bankers like you, but they don't know a lot about acquiring companies. Companies in the developed world, whether it's in the U.S. or in the U.K., France, Germany, have made a business in some cases, like Cisco, of acquiring other companies. What if you're a Chinese company? How do you attack this culturally? How do you make certain that it's going to be a success and not a spectacular failure? And M&A has a reputation for not delivering shareholder value. Good question. I think that they have compressed time. I think what we have found with these companies is they, they number one, have very good and sophisticated expertise in-house, and they've been building it very quickly. Number two, they are very, very thoughtful about hiring the right outside advisors. And number three, they take advice. And those things are all important in order for them to come up with coherent strategies, not just for the acquisitions, but for subsequent integration and operations. Leon, I want to highlight a trend before we go and ask you to comment on sure. it. This year in particular, we have seen foreign buyers play a smaller role in the U.S. M&A market, U.S. companies being acquired, uh, and U.S. companies are playing a bigger role in foreign acquisitions. We see some of that right here. Sure. Uh, only 18, foreign buyers are only playing an 18% role in the U.S. market, down from 32 just three years ago. And on the flip side, American buyers really active in the global M&A market. Why is that happening? Growth. Pure and simple, we have two things that are at work here right now. The ability to buy, to buy growth in emerging markets and the ability to fund it with cheap dollars. Those two trends are going to go on for a while to come here. Companies have got very well-repaired balance sheets in the United States. They have access to cheap capital. They can borrow dollars and buy assets inside of high-growth marketplaces right now and not only buy actual organic growth in those markets, but over time perhaps have an interest in currency play in terms of what happens vis-a-vis -vis their dollar borrowings and their non-dollar assets that they've purchased. So that's one trend. And then I think you will see slow activity in the U.S., but obviously the U.S. has been a difficult market for foreign acquirers, so people are careful before they compete in the U.S. as non-U.S. acquirers and are very, very specific about the types of their purchases. Leon, we'll end it there.